Hello everyone and welcome back to the Innsmouth case. So I did a video on this a little while back, which if you haven't seen that video, definitely be sure to check it out after this one. It will be linked down in the description below. But I did a video and it was me showcasing this game from the beginning to my first official death. And I've definitely played this game a lot more since then. I've spent many hours at this. But I decided to kind of show a little bit more because there are so many different storylines, so many predicaments that you can get yourself into. So I decided to just show a little bit more of this. So yeah. All right, so we are going to start this journey in the town square. And from here, we are actually going to be finding Tabitha and then going and returning her to Dahlia and we'll follow that storyline. But this is where we're gonna start. So let's go. Innsmouth, Town Square, the beating heart of the city, a big attraction for local tourism. It is animated by groups of visitors who are chatting away in the sun. A lot less animated are the lethargic locals who are lurching about the square. A rather creepy looking fountain is in the middle of the square. A gigantic fish-like stone statue stretches its claws towards the sky with water flowing out of its menacing jaw. The water sprays into the air providing a refreshing breeze to the tourists sitting around the edge of the fountain. Looking at it closely now it is all rather looks like a gigantic drooling fish monster. The square is surrounded by handsome old buildings although the side streets reveal the true Innsmouth crumbling facades just far enough away that the average tourist doesn't notice them immediately. You also notice the mean grimaces of gargoyles sternly looking down into the visitors from the corners of their buildings. You make a mental note to block out the Innsmouth architecture in future. At first glance, you can see the town hall and a police station behind the fountain. There should be a few more public facilities nearby, but you don't notice anything right away. You decide to... All right, let's scope out the surroundings. Let's do it. The town center is dilapidated and seems to be completely dead. None of the footpaths are maintained and weeds have worked their way into every crevice. You notice carelessly dumped fast food packages, beer bottles, and other trash. Some of the narrow side streets between the houses are so crammed with bulky trash that you wouldn't even be able to walk along them. Many of the houses are in poor state of repair. Cracked windows, loose wooden boards hanging off the walls, and doors nailed shut. It's impossible to tell in which color the houses were originally painted. You are struck by a bad stench several times, the cause of which you would rather not investigate. As you keep walking, you get to a kind of shopping street with a number of small shops. Half of them seem to be abandoned. The first shop on the corner is a snack bar. Its name, Joe's Pizza and Burger. It is printed in the big letters on an individual sheets of paper. Right next to it is there is a shop for fishing gear, then a hairdresser just a few doors down. In that shop window you can see faded photos of the trendiest hairstyles that the 1970s had to offer. Behind the hairdresser you make out a kiosk selling sweets and magazines and also a liquor store wedged in between two empty buildings. Opposite you find a shop whose name seems to be Zahn. Judging by the window it's a music store. At the other end of the street, there is a building with the inscription Arkham Arcades. The letters are made from neon tubes, but some appear to have been burnt out and have never been replaced. Maybe some of the shopkeepers will be able to tell you more about your client. You decide which shop to enter. Alright, we are going to continue to the arcades. There are other ways to get there. I believe if you go... I can't remember if it's the burger or the barber shop, but um, one of them will actually tell you that you can find, or that that a young girl her age would possibly be in the arcades, and that's how you get there. But yes, we're gonna go ahead and continue to the arcades. The game in the arcade is hard to miss. 
At the end of the dead shopping street, a shrill neon sign draws attention to itself. You think it looks rather retro, although the people of Innsmouth would probably think it's state-of-the-art design. As you approach, familiar sounds start ringing in your ears. A heady mix of cheaply produced gun sound effects and mysterious sounds from a pinball machine. This cocktail of synth effects... Um... Gives you nostalgia. Happy memories flood your brain. Your first beat -em up game when your opponent, a super limber septuagenarian and yoga dude who played the boxer, ripped you apart. And all those exciting moments when you managed to win. A few tourist families who have ventured into the city center with you were all dragged in here by their excited children. Now you two pass through the gates to the realm of flashing lights and bad ventilation. It's extremely dark and the screens of all the devices appear to be the only light source. Families, slackers, groups of teenagers, and individual children crowd together in front of the screens to catch a glimpse of the games that are currently being played or have a shot at playing themselves. The arcade is smaller than the elaborate archway initially suggested, but the equipment is not so bad for a small coastal town. Everything is beeping and flashing. Alright, so let's look at the games. One of the most important lessons you have learned, not from your own cases, but from television, is to look out for the small things. Only an absolute beginner would ignore the slot machines and look for the missing girl straight away. You, on the other hand, are playing the long game. Maybe you'll see her name token on one of the highest scored tables. Maybe you'll be able to improve your own reflexes, toughen yourself, and steal your nerves by playing a few rounds. A little girl is missing, but you'd rather play a round of computer games. But don't worry, no one will ever find out. How often will you return to Innsmouth, you ask yourself? The answer, of course, is hopefully never again. So you might as well make the most of it and try to leave new high scores for posterity. You in, you're interested in... Honestly, what brings me nostalgia is pinball. Like, I used to play the heck out of, like, the computer pinball. I love that thing. Um, I'm not a huge fan of pinball machines, IRL. But, that's what we're gonna go for. <laughs> Just because. On one of the walls, there is a row of pinball machines. Curiously, no one is playing or even looking in the direction of the machines. It's as if there's an invisible barrier that you have to cross to get into the area. Not even the unlicensed 80s movie themes seem to be of interest to anyone. Perhaps it's not so surprising after all. Who would try to chase after a real metal ball if they can't hunt down the virtual demon zombies? Good point. The good thing about pinball machines is that they're cheap. You only need a few coins and you don't have to queue. Out of the three machines available, you go for the one with the vaguely recognizable but definitely not licensed science fiction theme. The machine's barren spell has finally come to an end. You put in a quarter and it rumbles awake from its deep slumber. It lights up and the pinball shoots out of the bottom right corner into the playing area and starts jumping around between the bumpers. This is great. You have forgotten how cool reality can be. Using the two buttons on the side of the machine, you can move the flippers. When you play, you are... Considered and focused. The ball flips into the upper regions of the machine, bounces on the bumpers, and lands on one of the higher up flippers where you manage to hold it. Your fingers frantically jab the buttons on the flippers, go up and down, and the ball slowly rolls in down a little shaft onto the left closer and closer to the void. You start screaming. It's pure adrenaline. The frantic flippers manage to lift the ball up a fraction, but then you drop it right down into the middle. You've lost before the game has even properly started. The machine flashes and beeps, almost as if it were laughing at you. Now you know why no one else is playing the pinball machines. You step back to put some distance between you and this hellish machine. You still have two games left over, but you'd be happy for someone else to suffer through them. You decide to go back to the center of the arcade. Alright, let's try the first person shooters. Fantastic. Who would have thought that you'd come across one of your favorite games here in Hicksville? Shooter games obviously cost more money, but the graphics are the best. 
The pixel blood sprays abundantly and you can shoot at the screen with neon plastic weapons. Annoyingly, this is where the most people are queuing. It will take a while until it's your turn, but from what you can see on the screens, you're sure it'll be worth it. You choose... Um, let's do the Mason of the Unliving. In Mason of the Unliving, scientists is in a secret research lab under, well, a house. Have been experimenting... <laughs> Wait. Is this like Resident Evil? Scientists in a secret research lab under a house. Hmm, okay. Have been experimenting with a dangerous zombie virus. When the virus is accidentally let loose and all employees are turned into an army of the undead, it's up to you, the cleaner, to save the world by offing all of them. Doesn't sound too bad. Alright, let's queue. Mason of the Unliving. A good choice. The target demographic is a lot more alternative than that of the other games. Black t-shirts, black cargo pants, black beanies. In your brown trench coat, you stand out like a sore thumb from the rest of the gamer crowd. And you're also twice, thrice, and four times the age of the most of the people queuing. Right in front of you is a child who only reaches up to your hip. Ask the people in the queue. No, let's not do that. Just don't say anything. You know that, offline and, and online, the rule is not to cross the gaming community. Impatiently, you watch a child who still has some of his baby teeth struggling to reach the control panel. Luckily, he gets overrun by zombie hordes pretty quickly. After a few players are knocked out, it's your turn. Quicker than you thought, you put all the coins you have into the machine. Your hands clasp the black plastic gun. It feels good. The screen goes to black. The slogan, Mason of the Unliven flashes up. Then the intro of the game starts playing. Lovingly crafted camera work shows some polygon figure which tells the plot of the game. The message, pull the trigger to skip, keeps flashing up from time to time. Uh, yeah, let's keep watching it. Headquarters of the parasol- <laughs> Wait, the parasol? Oh, come on. The parasol- A parasol is basically an umbrella. And as you know from Resident Evil, it's a, the umbrella. That's just... Okay. Alright, that's cool. Headquarters of the Parasol Corp. A healthcare company. After a disappointing second quarter, shareholders demand some drastic measures such as a redundancies or the opening of a new market to increase dividends. Wow, who would have thought that the developers of a zombie shooter would actually take the story seriously? You're generally curious about where all this is going, but there's resistance behind you. Boring. Someone cries out. Hey, you've got to pull the trigger, then it will skip. Apparently, the people around you are not interested in watching the intro. Well, that makes it all the more reason to watch the intro. Let's go. You try and hush to the people behind you. The video keeps playing, the camera zooms into a white conference room in which pixelated people gesticulate wildly with their arms. In order to appease their shareholders, Paracel Corp expands its research into influence vaccine. A white block appears, it looks like it's supposed to be a building. In front of the doors, there are some blobs who seem to be holding signs up into the air. The process is made difficult due to regular staff strikes. There is lengthy negotiations with the unions. It's much calmer behind you now. Let's keep watching. The first tests are very promising, the voiceover continues. A first test of the vaccine happens during influenza season and batches of vaccine are delivered to doctors' offices and hospitals. Please kill me, someone in the crowd says, but another person shushes him. Graphs fills the screen, lots of graphs. The annual budget shows initial positive trends, but because of the research investments, profits are still low. Paracel Corp breaks even. Unions signal their willingness for compromise in order to keep jobs. I really hope they're gonna make it. My dad lost his job last year and we lost our house. A young boy next to you says, Oh man, I'm so sorry, says someone else in the crowd. There are now barely any impatient comments from your audience. It seems as if no one has ever let the intro of this game play to the end. No one is saying a word. Let's watch it. 
Stock exchange developments and more grass resolving the conflict with the unions. The voiceover calmly reports how Parasol Corp manages to become financially sound again and slowly turns into the marketing leading or the market leading health company. It engages in social projects, provides jobs, and supports the economy. The whole audience now contemplates in silence. Lots to chew on here, and you even think that you've learned some new things about business plans and economic strategies. The intro reaches its final part. A lab assistant accidentally knocks over a sealed test tube and its greenish contents spread out on the lab floor. Then, everyone turns into zombies. Well, that was a bit disappointing. Someone murmurs behind you. Indeed. Compared with the carefully researched background of Paracel Corp, the part with the zombies seems sloppy. The intro fades and the game continues. Oh, whoa, the music changed. Okay. Bloody lettering splatters onto the screen and lets you know about your mission. Level 1. Survive. Is that it? With nothing but a handgun, your character stands in a seemingly endless corridor. Hordes of roaring zombies come at you. Yeah, yes! Your audience is visibly excited about the upcoming battle for survival. You shoot at the pixelated heads and those enemies you've hit slowly turn transparent and vanish. You seem to have endless ammunition and you only need to shoot outside of the screen to reload. After what feels like a hundred kills, you start to feel bored. Why was there a cue for this machine? Your motivation to stay alive dwindles rapidly and is being replaced with a desire to do something useful. Maybe even solve your case. The zombies overrun you and wordlessly you hand the plastic gun to the next player. As you move out of the line, you cannot believe your eyes. In front of you stands Tabitha Marsh. She waves at you excitedly, her bug eyes, or bug-like eyes, <laughs> sparkling. You are the first person to look at this story. Now I finally know how Paracel Corp started. Many people don't really pay much attention to the story in games. Words fail you. Yeah. Wait, what if we... No, let's talk to her. So as not to scare the girl, you gently sink down to your knees. Tabitha, your mother has asked me to bring you home. The girl scrunches up her face. What? My name isn't Tabitha. Uh... Yeah, let's show her the photo. You find the Polaroid you were given by her mother and show it to her. Oh, where did you get that? Your mother gave it to me. She is very concerned about you and misses you a lot. What do you mean? I've only been gone from home for an hour. Confused, she looks at the photo of herself. I'd be like, sorry, what? What now? It's difficult to tell the girl's age. The shape of her head suggests that she might be suffering from a kind of illness that impacts on her growth. Is she confused or simply in a difficult phase of puberty? What's your real name? The girl smiles. I'm Evelyn. Visibly uneasy, the girl nods. I shouldn't be here anyway. Finally, you found the girl. Now you only need to pick her up or pick up the reward. <laughs> I was like, pick her up. Um, pick up your reward and then you can finally leave this dump of a place and relax at home. Evelyn starts making her way outside, passing by other families and their children. Luckily, no one seems to suspect anything untoward is happening, and you finally reach the exit. Okay, off to... You flip the Polaroid over for the address that Dolly has noted down on its back. 43 Shogoth Avenue? The girl shakes her head. That's the wrong address. Wrong? What do you mean, wrong? Why would your mother give me the wrong address? The girl rolls her eyes. I don't know. Can we go now? Our house is not far from here. You should have foreseen that it wouldn't be that easy. Alright, let's go. If her real address is somewhere close, it should be easy enough to find out whether she's lying or not. You give in and put the Polaroid back in your coat pocket. Okay, you lead the way. Evelyn is visibly relieved. She points a little at a little side street you hadn't noticed before. The little girl is leading you across town. When you read the street name, Raleigh Road, you realize you are on your way to the northern part of the city. 
Had you followed the address that Dali left you, you would have ended up in a completely different area. The other end of the town, to be exact. You wonder what would have awaited you there. Evelyn strides ahead and purposely into the area in which she claims to live. Apart from the two of you, there is no one else on the streets, although it's only late afternoon. But you can sense that you are not alone. The curtains in the windows of the surrounding houses are constantly moving. The streets are getting narrower and narrower. Good thing you don't suffer from claustrophobia. Evelyn isn't speaking. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk to her. Nothing wrong with clearing a few things up while we're walking. Hey, listen. Evelyn looks down and looks at you expectantly. Something appears to make her sad. Um... Yeah, let's ask her why she thinks that she's gone missing. Why did your mother think you've gone missing? The girl's face falls and she looks back down at the footpath. I don't know. That was too direct, it seems. She's clearly hiding something, but your question has scared her off. While she keeps leading you along the road, you wonder how you can coax something out of her. Here we are. By now, you've left the narrow alleys of the old town and you're standing in front of a wonky metal fence. Behind it is an old-fashioned mansion on a little hill, a surprisingly grand property. Considering that in the rest of the town, people appear to live like sardines. Evelyn and you stand there for a little while. Um, alright, let's go. Right, shall we go in? Evelyn nods bravely. She fishes around in her pockets and gets out a small set of keys with two shiny golden keys. She takes the larger one of the two and puts it into the lock on the gate. A bit rusty, she says apologetically. Despite the fact that she must have opened the gate many times, Evelyn needs a few attempts to finally open it. After it finally makes a loud clicking sound, the girl pushes down the massive door handle and the gate swings open. The gravel makes a crunching sound under your shoes. You've made it halfway to the house when you start to consider a few things. In a few seconds, you will see Dahlia Marsh again. Duplicious Dahlia Marsh. A shiver runs down your spine. Evelyn is already walking up the stairs to the porch and is nearly at the door. Yep, let's enter. The girl puts the second key of the covenant into the lock and turns it round. The door opens with a creak. The beams of the walls growl deeply and magnificently, as if you were standing in front of the mouth of a lion. Evelyn gropes for something in the darkness. You can hear a soft click and the corridor is flooded with light. The entrance area of the house alone offers so much space that a smaller house could fit inside. A wide, white, lacquered staircase leads up to the higher floor. Your steps are commented on by groaning floorboards. Mother? The little girl cries loudly into the house. The clinking of glass, the ever-accelerating sound of high heels. A light goes on in the room next door, and shortly afterwards, the door is open wide. The daylight gives Dahlia Marsh's face demonic features. When her gaze falls on her mother, her eyes reflect anger. When she sees you, horror. I wonder if all mothers in Innsmouth react in this way when they are reunited with their lost daughters. You? Um, yeah, case solved. Case solved, ma'am. The expression of outright horror is still on Dahlia's face. While the little girl looks up worried at her mother, Dahlia holds her hand in front of her mouth, an antiquity gesture which reminds you of an old film in which men had strange beards and the women wore corsets. She recovers herself quickly, and an effective smile spreads on her lips. How nice to see you. Before you can reply anything, she kneels down gracefully and gently ruffles her daughter's hair. There you are, Angel. Are you okay? Evelyn nods, but she's actually... Or she's not actually said anything ever since you've entered the house. Dahlia seems to be satisfied with this response. Apparently completely recovered from her initial shock, she gets up and gives you a dazzling smile. Dinner is almost ready. Why don't you stay so we can discuss everything else? Her smile is tense. Yep. We're gonna go with the option just for ask for immediate payment. I honestly don't remember what this does. Um, if you choose Dinner Sounds Splendid, you will get thrown into a whole different other situation where you're basically trying to survive. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we've been trying to survive this whole entire game, 
but you definitely are like you might be poisoned you might die from a dagger you might even get a gunshot wound so there's many possibilities if you choose dinner but we're gonna go for this one i'm sorry but i don't have much time you just want to leave you can do without any more answers from your shady client she's visibly disappointed by this oh well in that case why don't you accompany me to the safe she turns to her daughter smiling darling go to your room we'll talk later the girl nods and rushes up the stairs Dahlia now walks over to the room she came from and leaves the door open for you to follow. Ooh, I don't actually remember what happens. Um, what if, why don't we stay in the hall? You'd rather stay where you are. That's okay, I'll just wait here. You call after her. She walks off, the tick-tock of her heels echoing on the wooden floorboards. You could swear that you can hear voices from the adjoining rooms. One of the voices is Dahlia's, and the other one sounds very familiar. You can't make out what they're saying, though, and before too long, the whispering stops and Dahlia comes back. She holds out an envelope and purses her lips. Thank you again. Um, yeah, let's thank her. You stow away the money in the inside pocket of your coat. Very glad I was able to help. With these words and a last smile, you turn away from Dahlia Marsh and open the door to the outside world. As you make your way to the front gate, pebbles crunching under your feet, you turn around one last time. You just catch a last glimpse of Dahlia closing the door. There was definitely a satisfied smile on her lips. You think. Um, yeah, you don't like this at all. The smile is cold and dark, but you can't figure out why you would think that. What game is she playing? At least you can now put some distance between the two of you and that's all that matters. You're on your way, but you're still pondering this. You wander the streets, the dark clouds spread out from the sea, like claws that ominously reach for the town, reach for you. The sun has set and the temperature is dropping fast. The air, too, gets colder, and a rough wind whips through the alleys. You're lost. You have no idea how to get out of this forsaken town. And as if that weren't bad enough, you also underestimated the September weather on the coast. And the real cold temperature is still yet to come. Scattered raindrops do not bode well. You aimlessly wander the streets. The narrow alleys are a labyrinth of simple wooden fishermen huts. At least you're not completely on your own. Look at that. Even at this late hour, there are groups of people out patrolling with torches and pitchforks and knives and nets. Hmm. Yeah, let's stay in the shadows. It's not easy, but... Or... <laughs> it's not necessarily the knives and the nets that make you worried. It's the limp that many of the villagers have, which makes you nervous. The people don't walk. They waddle, stagger, stumble and shuffle with their upper bodies lifted up like malicious trolls in a fantasy film i know a few people who waddle and and a shuffle yeah it's um i feel bad for them but at the same time it is, it's a little funny you have found refuge behind some old barrels in a narrow side street you would love to simply huddle up here in the middle of the alley you are without protection against the rain the pitchforked mom still hasn't noticed you. You wonder what to do next. Okay, let's knock on a door and ask for help. Maybe not all the people here are cranky, cold-hearted hicks. Maybe someone will let you spend the night in their town if you just ask politely. Maybe pigs can fly. The opposite was never proven. Anyway, the idea of spending the night in the warmth and leaving Innsmouth early tomorrow morning fills you with a new hope. Your hand glides over your wrinkled trench coat, which really needs to be ironed. You're a freelance, so you have enough experience looking pitiable. You've got a good feeling about this. Since all wooden huts look similarly run down, you simply knock on the next best door in order to escape the rain. The patter on the ever-increasing rain is the only thing you can hear. No steps, no metallic clicking of keys, and no good Samaritan to let you into their house at this dark hour. No one seems to be there. Let's try another one. There's another one just over there. 
Again, you try your luck and knock three times quickly. Again, no one lets you in. The difference is that this time you hear the rustling sound of curtains. In the window next to the door, the curtain sways slightly back and forth until it comes to a rest. There was someone. Let's try and provoke. Leaning your arms against the wooden planks, you try to take a look inside, but it is too dark to see anyone or anything. This is exactly the kind of cowardly attitude that has led this town into poverty and ruin. You hiss at the curtains because somebody must be listening. Good deeds are what separates everyday heroes from the common peasants. Good deeds like giving shelter to the poor private detectives on rainy nights. You can't be sure that the occupant of this house has heard even one word of what you just said. Still, you feel a little better now. A creaking sound behind you makes you freeze. The door, right behind you. An old woman is peering out of the house in front of which you were shouting. She has cracked open the front and examines you through round spectacles. She reminds you of an insect. Her voice is rough as sandpaper. What do you want? Um, we need a, you have beautifies. Oh my. Okay, I need a place to stay for the night. Uh, you say honestly. I need a place to stay for the night. You say honestly. She licks her lips. Wait, what? Was it you who was just ranting out there? Uh, yes. So she did hear you. Yes, I guess that was me, you answer truthfully. It's a very urgent call. The woman looks you up and down. You feel assessed and judged. Then there's a rattling cough, and judging by the raised corners of her mouth, she may even be laughing. Well, at least you're honest, kid. She opens the door a little wider and waves you in. Okay, come on in. Gratefully, you step into the apartment. You try to make out details about the inside of the dark old house. Candles are lined up on the shelves and small side tables. A lot of them are almost burned down. At least they keep you from running into the furniture. The old woman is probably blind and that's why she doesn't need lighting on her in, or in her own home. Only with a lot of effort you can make out the contours of narrow doors that line the walls of the rooms. Whoever is responsible for the design of this hut has obviously tried to squeeze as much as possible into every limited space. I have a guest bed available. You can have it if you help me with the gardening, sweetie. Um, sure. I don't want to bother- uh, no, okay. Sure, I can help in the garden. The woman at the l is at least a hundred years old. You assume the only thing she needs help with is picking some daisies from the grass. She claps her hand. Perfect. Let's get straight down to work, and afterwards, Ethel will make you hot tea. So the name's Ethel. The lively old woman immediately scurries through one of the narrow doors and hastily waves to you f to follow her. A smile creeps onto your face. You've got a good feeling about this. Trying not to knock anything over, you make your way through the darkness. This place seems like... like less than a house and more like an art installation. You walk through another room that doesn't even have any candles, but a faint source of light leads you further. As you cross the room, you almost trip over a bag laying on the floor. This must be the storage room where the old lady keeps her potato sacks. The bag makes a squeaky sound. Poor harvest, evidently. Let's just walk into the garden. You push the door open a little further and step onto the small, dilapidated veranda. It appears that every single one of the small houses in this residential area has its own back garden, which is shielded from the neighbors by high wooden fences. Ethel's garden is well protected from any prying looks. It also... It's very small. Only a medium-sized paddling pool would have room here in summer, but the old woman seems to have her own plans regarding the use of her small garden. Before you graced her with your presence, she was in the process of digging an elongated pit. That's not a bad sign. Okay. Given the rain and the hard ground, this could not have been an easy task. She hasn't made a lot of progress. 
There's a shovel in the heap of earth that is piled up next to the pit. A long brown bag with many stains lies on the other side of the pit in the damp grass. The pit would have to be dug a, a bit deeper for the bag to fit, though. So... Ethel claps her hands. You freeze. You hadn't noticed her coming up next to you. This needs to be buried before it starts to stink. Your hands grab the shaft of the shovel, but then something catches your attention. It's the linen bag. It... Its contents twist and turn with alarming regularity. Um, what's in the bag? What's in the bag, you ask? Even as you ask the question, you doubt whether you will like the answer. Well, if you really want to know, sweetie... Ethel leans against a pillar on her porch. Your question seems to amuse her. It's a bunch of rabid ferrets. They came and dug up almost half of the garden. Most of them I shot to kingdom come. And the old woman pretends to aim with a rifle. But I must not have killed all of them right dead. The twitching from the linen cloth still has your full attention. It is regular, almost hypnotizing, just like a lava lamp. Um. Alright, chop chop. You grab the shovel and get ready to work on the small ditch that has already been dug. Chop chop. The faster you dig the ominous pit for the suspicious bag, the sooner you will be able to sleep, hopefully without ferret-filled nightmares. Toot toot. Ethel does the gesture of a train driver. How nice. Pensioners with such a sunny disposure are rare. The earth is softer than you had anticipated. Instead of rock hard ground, you dig up soft earth and quite a few bones and some dental braces. Um, let's just not say anything. Bit by bit, you dig the pit further, and soon you've produced a huge pile of earth, which is full of bones. Ethel seems very pleased with your work. Before you know it, the old woman is standing at your side, digging you in the ribs with her elbow. Well, that was a piece of cake for a young person like you, wasn't it, sweetie? She clasps her hands and leads you to the bag, which is now writhing as if possessed by the devil. Go on. Bag in. Bit of dirt on top. The end. A skinny hand pats you on the back. I'll put on the kettle. Ethel returns to the house and leaves you alone with a... D -d a dug ditch? With... Oh, <laughs> I was so confused. Okay. She leaves you alone with the dug ditch. A twitching linen bag and many questions. You. No, let's just get down to business. Tea. Tea sounds good, especially after a day like today. The linen bag at your feet is still writhing back and forth as if possessed by the devil. After careful consideration, you decide. Uh, carefully roll it into the pit or violently kick it into the pit. Um, if it is a person, which 99.9%, .9 it is. It's not going to really matter what we do, whether we carefully roll it or kick it, uh, because they're going to be smothered to death. <laughs> um, but I don't know. We'll just carefully roll it. Mindful not to touch the still withering bag, you push it carefully into the excavated pit. It actually did feel as if quite a few small animals were frantically running around in the bag. Old Ethel was obviously telling the truth. Life is happy song, and you shovel the heaped-up soil back into the pit. You make an effort to distribute the previously exposed bones into the soil with authentic regularity. You want to leave everything the way you found it. Then your work is done. The moment you ram the shovel into the ground, lightning strikes over Innsmouth, followed by a crashing roll of thunder. Better go inside. Inside the hut, you follow a trail of tea lights that guide you back into the living room like a landing strip. Ethel comes out of the room that you hadn't even noticed before. Here is my little guest room. I hope you like it. Tea is nearly ready. After thanking Ethel for her hospitality, you disappear into the small room to recover from the exertion of digging. Although the guest room is also lit by nothing other than candles, it's cozier than the rest of the house. This is possibly due to the light-colored wallpaper which has covered the wadded wood. The evening is lovely. 
delicious tea and cookies with Ethel and a warm bed. You're sleeping great. In the morning, Ethel has prepared a huge breakfast for you in the first sun rays of the day bathe the house, which seemed so creepy last night in the soft light. It's crazy how perception can play such tricks on you. When you leave her house and wave goodbye, you realize something. It occurs to you that Ethel is an awful animal abuser. Um, you just, you just keep waving. You just keep waving and try to suppress the memories of dead ferrets. God, this town is the worst. It's a Sunday morning with no shady patrols and frog-like creatures lurking in the shadows. Every now and then you have thoughts like, nice place or not so terrible creep up on you. The sunshine helps definitely. A front of gray clouds is already lurking on the horizon, but the bright morning hours ease the paranoia from last night. What also helps is the fact that not a soul is out and about. If you look like the person, or look like the people from Innsmouth, you'd probably also venture out at night. With these musings, you walk through in the old town and back into the city center. It doesn't take you long until you stand in front of the bus that will take you and a handful of villagers back to Boston. It didn't go so badly. Alright, this is months later. The first rays of sun caress your cheeks. A good day indeed. Even the traffic right outside your bedroom is moderate today. At least for this early time of day. Thanks to your successful work at Innsmouth, you can afford to be at the office a little later. Dahlia did give you a big bonus that should have sorted you out for at least six months. If you handle things in the right way now and manage to get the follow-up cases, you should be financially stable in no time. A smile sneaks onto your face when you think about your trip to Innsmouth. A bunch of odd characters, no doubt, but that's what country folk are like. You already miss the sea breeze. Maybe another weekend trip to that little seaside town is in order soon. Living like high society on a shoestring budget. Then you might also be able to try those fish delicacies you've been dreaming about. With a yawn, you bury your head back in your pillow. Just a few more minutes. Alright! And there we go! Actually, I really feel like that's probably the best ending that we could have gotten. I've actually never played that specific one all the way through. I've I've been to the old woman's house before, but I didn't follow that story path. So this is very interesting. Um, so we did get the ending of Innocence, which is cluelessly you escaped from Innsmouth all, or all in all a nice weekend. So that's probably the best ending that you can get out of all of the endings that is probably the best one that you can get or i'd say the ending that i got in the first playthrough which was i think it was you did the best that you could or something like that okay yeah it was this one which is a bad feeling you returned to boston you did everything you could i honestly think that the innocence or the bad feeling are probably the best endings that you can achieve um now other people might have their opinions about it but just to kind of give you a reference, there are, I'm thinking two other endings to going to the woman's house. And I did show this one before. There's rabid ferrets and there's also buried alive. That's just two endings that you could have possibly gotten. Um, but I'm really happy about the ending that we got uh, during this little playthrough. Even though I have played this quite a bit, that specific little storyline with the old woman uh, was due to me so I did like that but I enjoyed that ending um, those are probably like I said the best endings that you can get other than just simply rejecting the case from the beginning which there is actually an ending for that I'm trying to think of which one it is I think it's this one yeah let's call it a day you reject the mission adventure thanks but no thanks which literally that is that is the ending like you just straight up reject the mission at the very beginning and that's that's it <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you kind of have to weigh it hand in hand. I mean, if you went to Innsmouth, you would have to survive the day and night and hope that you wouldn't lose your mind or just simply straight off the bat reject the case and never have to worry about that. Now, for the game's sake, definitely exploring Innsmouth is very fun. Um, but as far as if you're trying to put yourself in your character's view, 
I would say the best outcome is just rejecting the case right off the bat. But that is that. That is going to be it for me. That is my official playthrough of this game. If you guys want to see more of this, I highly suggest that you check out the game for yourself. It will be linked down in the description below. There are so many different possibilities and storylines, so definitely check it out. But that's going to be it. So I hope that you guys did enjoy. If you did, be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you guys all again next time. Goodbye.